I don't see where uh, the uh, awareness that we're aware. The, the the hard problem doesn't feel like it's solved. I mean, there 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 it, it it's called a hard problem for a reason, because it seems like there needs to be a major leap. Yeah, I think the major leap is to understand how it is possible that a machine can dream, that a physical system is able to create a representation that the yeah. physical system is acting on, and that is spun force and so on. But once you accept the fact that you are not in physics, but that you exist inside of the story, I think the mystery disappears. Everything is possible in a story. You exist inside the story. Okay. So Your the consciousness machine... is being written into the story. The fact yeah. that you experience things is written to the, side of the story. You ask yourself, is this real what I'm seeing? And your brain writes into the story, yes, it's real. So what about the perception of consciousness? So to me, you look conscious. So... Um, the illusion of consciousness, the demonstration of consciousness. Uh, I ask for the the legged robot. How do we make this legged robot conscious? So there's two things, and maybe you can tell me if they're neighboring ideas. One is actually make it conscious, and the other is make it appear conscious to others. Are those related? Uh, let's ask it from the other direction. What would it take to make you not conscious? So when you are thinking about how you perceive the world, can you decide to switch from looking at qualia to looking at representational states? And it turns out you can. Yeah. There is a particular way in which you can look at the world and recognize its machine nature, including your own. And in that state, you don't have that conscious experience in this way anymore. It becomes uh, apparent as a representation. Everything becomes opaque. And I think this thing that you recognize everything as a representation, this is typically what we mean with enlightenment states. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you so can happen on the motivational level, yeah. but it, you can also do this on the experiential level, on the perceptual level. See, but then I can come back to a conscious state. Okay, I particularly, I'm referring to the social aspect that the demonstration of consciousness is a really nice thing at a party when you're trying to meet a new person. It, it's it, it's a nice thing to, to to know that they're conscious and they can, um, how, I don't know how fundamental consciousness is in human interaction, but it seems like to be at least uh, an important part. And I, I ask that in the same kind of way for robots, you know, in order to create a, a rich, compelling human robot interaction, it feels like there needs to be elements of consciousness within that interaction. Uh, my cat is obviously conscious. And uh, so my cat can do this party trick. She also knows that I am conscious. We're able to have feedback about the fact that we are both acting on models of yes. our own awareness. The question is how hard is it for it, uh, the robot, artificially created robot to achieve cat level in uh, tr party tricks. Yes. So the issue for me is currently not so much on how to build a system that creates a story about a robot that lives in the world, but to make an adequate representation of the world. Hmm. And the model, model that you and me have is a unified one. It's where, one where you basically make sense of everything that you can perceive. Every feature in the world that uh, enters your perception can be relationally mapped to a unified model of everything. Mm -hmm. And we don't have an AI that is able to construct such a unified model yet. So you need that unified model to do the party trick? Yes. I think that uh, you, it doesn't make sense if this thing is conscious, but not in the same universe as you, because <laughs> you could not relate to each other. So what's the process, would you say, of engineering consciousness in a machine? Like, uh, what are the ideas here? So uh, you probably want to have some kind of perceptual system. This perceptual system is a processing agent that is able to track sensory data and predict the next frame in the sensory data from the previous frames of the sensory data in the current state of the system. So the current state of the system is, in perception, instrumental to predicting what happens next. Mm -hmm. And this means you build lots and lots of functions that take all the blips that you feel on your skin and uh, that you see on your retina or that you hear uh, and puts them into a set of relationships that allows you to predict what kind of sensory data, what kind of sensor of blips, your uh, vector of blips, you're going to perceive in the next frame, mm -hmm. right? This is tuned and it's uh, constantly tuned until it gets as accurate as it can. 
uh, you build a very accurate prediction mechanism that is step one of the perception. So first you predict, then you perceive and see the error yes. in your prediction. And you have to do two things to make that happen. One is you have to build a network of relationships that are constraints that uh, take all the variants in the world, put each of the uh, variances into a vari variable mm -hmm. that is uh, connected with relationships to other variables. And these relationships are computable functions that constrain each other. So when you see a nose that points in a certain direction in space, you have a constraint that says there should be a face nearby that has the same direction. Mm -hmm. right? And if that is not the case, you have some kind of contradiction that you need to resolve because it's probably not a nose what you're looking at. It just looks like one. So you have to reinterpret the data and until you get to a, a point where your model converges. And this process of making the sensory data fit into the, your model structure is what Piaget calls the uh, assimilation. And mm -hmm. accommodation is the change of the models where you change your model in such a way that you can assimilate everything. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're talking about building a hell of an awesome perception system that's able to do prediction and perception correct and, and keep no, improving. Wait, just, uh, you had the wait there's half. more. Yes, there's more. So the <laughs> first thing that we wanted to do is we want to minimize the contradictions in the model. Yes. And of course, it's very easy to make a model in which you minimize the contradictions just by allowing that it can be in many, many possible states. Right? So if you increase the degrees of freedom, you will have fewer contradictions. Mm -hmm. But you also want to reduce the degrees of freedom because degrees of freedom mean uncertainty. You want your model to reduce uncertainty as much as possible. But reducing uncertainty is expensive. So you have to have a trade-off between minimizing contradictions and reducing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And you have only a finite amount of compute and uh, experimental time and effort available to reduce uncertainty in the world. So you need to assign value to what you observe. Mm -hmm. So you need some kind of motivational system that is estimating what you should be looking at and what you should be thinking about it, how you should be applying your resources to model what that is. Mm -hmm. Right, so you need to have something like uh, convergence links that tell you how to get from the present state of the model to the next one. You need to have these compatibility links that tell you which constraints exist and which constraint violations exist. And uh, you need to have some kind of motivational system that tells you what to pay attention to. So now we have a second agent next to the perceptual agent. We have a motivational agent. This is a cybernetic system that is modeling what the system needs, what's important for the system, and that interacts with the perceptual system to maximize the expected reward. And you're saying the motivational system is some kind of, like, what is it, a higher level narrative over some lower level? No, it's just your brainstem stuff, the limbic system stuff that tells you, okay, now you should get something to eat because I've just uh, measured your blood sugar. So you mean like down. motivational system, like the lower level stuff, yes. like hungry? Yes, but it, there's basically a physiological needs and some cognitive needs and some social needs, and they all interact. And they're all implemented at different parts in your uh, nervous system as the motivational system. But they're basically cybernetic feedback loops. It's not that complicated. It's just a lot of code. And uh, so you now have a motivational agent that makes your robot go for the ball or that makes your worm uh, go to eat uh, food and uh, so on. And uh, you have the perceptual system that lets it predict that environment so it's able to solve that control problem to some degree. And now what we learned is that it's very hard to build a machine learning system that looks at all the data simultaneously to see what kind of relationships could exist between them. Mm -hmm. So you need to selectively model the world. You need to figure out where can I make the biggest difference if I would put the following things together? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you find a gradient for that, right? When you have a gradient, you don't need to remember where you came from. You just follow the gradient until it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. But if you have a world where the problems are discontinuous and the search spaces are discontinuous, you need to retain memory of what you explored. and You need to construct a plan of what to explore next. And this thing that means that you have next to this perceptual construction system, and the motivational cybernetics, an agent that is paying attention to what it should select at any given moment to maximize reward. And this scanning system, this attention agent, is required for consciousness. And consciousness it's, it's, is its control model. So it's the index memories that this thing retains when it manipulates the perceptual representations to uh, maximize the value and minimize the conflicts and to increase coherence. So the purpose of consciousness is to create coherence in your perceptual representations, remove conflicts, predict the future, construct counterfactual representations so you can coordinate your actions and so on. And in order to do this, it needs to form memories. 
These memories are partial binding states of the working memory contents that are being revisited later on to backtrack, to undo certain states, to look for alternatives. And these indexed memories that you can recall, that is what you perceive as your stream of consciousness. And being able to recall these memories, this is what makes you conscious. If you could not remember what you paid attention to, you wouldn't be conscious. Mm. <laughs> so consciousness is the index in the memory database. Okay. 